Lord, in Jeremiah 31, 3, you said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That is why I have drawn you to me with cords of loving kindness. Lord, this day we come to you and we're so thankful that in your grace, Lord, you bless us with everything that your heart can give us. And this day, Lord, we'd like to thank you together as your people for the glorious love and kindness you've shown us through Jesus. Even today, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts and we ask forgiveness for every sin in our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, and may you cleanse us with your blood. And we thank you that your love and grace continues to reach down to us. Even in our brokenness and sin, you still love us, Lord, and you only desire, Lord, for us to come to you, that you may cover us with your blood and be restored. Father, we forgive those who have sinned against us this day. We may not allow any bitterness in our hearts to remain before your presence. For you have forgiven us all our sins, and you have loved us even if we never deserved it. Lord, we all, like one another, we all fail and sin. And I thank you for the compassion that you have shown us. And Lord, we forgive everyone who has hurt us. And we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit to bring healing, Lord, to our woundedness. We thank you for your love that affirms us each day. And we bless those, Lord, who have hurt us. We bless those who have offended us as you have commanded us. And this day, O oh Lord, we rejoice in you because of the grace that you have given us. We thank you so much, Father. We receive your love today. We receive your Father's love in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all take our seats in the presence of God. Praise God. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. We are so thankful to God that today we started our design service, 7.30 to 9. There was just a few of those who came, but it was just the beginning. And we praise God that we now have two congregations, a Visaya and an English congregation. Of course, you're welcome to join both services. If you want to join the Visaya and the English, you're very much welcome to stay on, okay? Praise the Lord. I just want you to know this morning, that regardless of how you see yourself, regardless of your failures, your sins, your mistakes, if you're willing to come to God with humility of heart and acknowledge what you have done before Him, I want you to know God is just more than willing to receive you again. Amen? You see, remember that God is always the one reaching out to us. Tayo po malimit, hindi na tayo nag-reach out to God pag tayo yung medyo we feel guilty, may nanggawa tayo hindi tama, at nag-struggle na naman tayo sa mga problema, we are so hesitant to reach out to God because shame covers us. We feel so ashamed to come to God. But I want you to know, God has taken your shame away already. And He put that shame on His Son Jesus on that cross. That was He was, you know, how Jesus was crucified was very shameful. And He placed all your sins upon Him. And that's why the Father had to hide His face for three hours from 12 noon to 3 o'clock when Jesus finally gave his spirit, there was darkness all over the land. And it was during the time that Jesus, now knowing that all the sins of the world, your sins and my sins have been placed on him, is now experiencing a temporary separation from his father, which is death, which is spiritual death. And that's what he took on that cross. And he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus took all your sin and your shame 2,000 years ago. And therefore, he wants to release you from that if you will come to him, repent of your sin, and confess your sin to him because God is more than willing to forgive you. Amen? Whenever we come together to worship God every Sunday, what should be in our hearts is the joy of the Lord. But we cannot have the joy of the Lord if our hearts are filled with guilt and shame, anxiety because of problems with money, problems, you know, in the house, problems with our family members. We cannot really worship God. To enter the courts of God, our hearts must already be prepared. And we know that God has forgiven us our sins. And we can entrust our burdens to God and know that God will take care of those problems. And He will give you wisdom so you will know what your part will be. But God is always there to carry your burdens. Amen? Our Father in heaven loves to carry us. 
Ito malalaki, malalaki na tayo, no? <clears throat> I remember my daughter Genesis is already, how old is Genesis now? Turning 13. She's going to be a teenager this year because ano yung, whatever is the last two digits in the year, 2013, that's her age for that year. Because she was born in 2000. Okay? You know, even at the age of 13, there are times she'll come to, oh, Ma, you know, she wants me to carry her. <laughs> and there are times I'm so tired, I can do it. There are times I will oblige, okay, it's okay. <laughs> you know, like that. And you know, in, in the eyes of our Father God, He would love to carry you. You'll never be a time you say, God, can you carry me? You'll never say, no, I'll carry you. Amen? I want you to know that the Father's love is more than you can ever imagine. Do not compare your heavenly Father with your earthly Father. There's a world of difference. Amen? Our earthly fathers are not perfect just like us. Amen? And they make mistakes. And we're going to talk about that this today because we're going to take a look at two great men in the Bible. Both of them came from similar circumstances in their homes. Both of these great men were repressed in their families. They were looked down, they were, they were despised. They had parents who looked down on them. In a sense, we can say that they carried a cursed identity because the parents seemed did not uh, consider them to be worthy of all the love of the father. And that's why these two men grew up, and yet even though they had the same experience in their family, they grew up and fulfilled different destinies. Today we're going to talk about how the Father's love affects identity and destiny. And I would like to ask to take a look at the love of your Father in heaven and how He gives you identity and destiny. Let's talk about identity. Identity means who you are. When you say, who am I? You're talking about identity. Identity has something to do with how you look at yourself, okay? If you were going to draw in a band paper how you look at yourself and think of anything in creation, you know, a plant, an animal, to draw yourself, what animal would you choose? Okay? To describe how you see yourself, okay? Some of you will, of course, think of a very positive image. Some of you will think of probably a negative image, depending on what you're going through right now. How many of you experience there are times when you commit mistakes, you commit failures, you tend to hate yourself a lot? How many of you? Let's be honest. I want you to see those hands. Go around. Come on, be honest. How many of you tend to hate yourself when you do something wrong? Okay, praise God. You know, it's good and bad. It's good because you're very much aware of who you are. Left to yourselves, right? And you know you're not good enough. Sometimes we, we just cannot, you know, please God. We feel there are so many things wrong with us and that's what we get focused on most of the time, right? We walk in guilt and shame each day. And that's why we cannot rise out to enjoy and experience the love of God because we have built so much protective layers in our hearts that even the love of God we cannot receive because we believe, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve to be loved. And that's why we try to, try to stay away. God wants to hug us. God wants to care us, but I'm not worthy. I'm too dirty. I'm too bad, right? How many of you feel that way when you, sometimes when you come to God? Okay, praise the Lord. Thank you for the honest people. Some are still struggling with that. <laughs> Amen. And that's how we see ourselves, listen to this, affects our relationship with God, with people. It affects also our performance. Because when you look down on ourselves, we tend to think that others also look down on us. Is that true? Right? When we look down on ourselves, when we're so focused on what's wrong with me, there's so many things wrong with me, I don't like myself, I wish I was a better person, I wish I had better family, I could have been, been, become a better person if I had a better family, and begin to start, you know, uh, find somebody to blame, and sometimes we just hate ourselves for being who we are, right? And because of that, we tend to be sensitive about how people think of us. Right, right, right? You know, when people are talking there and one looked at you, they begin to think, they're talking about me. 
Well, how do you know they're talking about you? Maybe you just pass by, you look so beautiful, the, 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 the person just look at you because you're so cute, and this, they keep talking. It doesn't mean that they're talking about you. <laughs> just because somebody looked at you while you were passing by, right? And sometimes when we look at people, we feel that, you know, when we feel guilty, we feel everybody knows about it, right? <laughs> you know, somebody said, the guilty run even when nobody is chasing. You understand that? The guilty is always running even though when there's no one chasing. And so when you look down on yourself, you will tend to think that people do the same and you become suspicious about the, what they're thinking about you, right? And even though there's, they're not thinking anything about you, you begin to impute, you know, uh, offense to them. You begin to become judgmental of people, right? Why? Because we're so protective of our identity because it's so damaged. I don't want anybody adding more damage to it. And so what we do, we begin to build walls, right? Walls of self-protection so that when somebody just makes you feel even the smallest feeling of rejection, you begin to fire out, you know? <laughs> or you begin to withdraw, right? Because I don't want to feel any more rejected than I'm rejecting myself. And you see, when you, have, when you look down on yourself, you cannot really love people genuinely because you'll be more concerned about protecting yourself. Right? True or false? That's why there's no end to fighting in the husband-wife relationships. Because when both of them feel inadequate, they both feel you know, guilty somehow of their own failures. They cannot just stand it when the wife points out what's wrong with the, per with the husband, right? And the wife cannot stand it when the husband points out what's wrong with her, right? We can no longer be corrected. <laughs> Why? Because when we're corrected, we feel we're being condemned. Right? Because we think this person is rejecting me because all throughout my growing years, whenever I do something wrong, my, my dad will you know, lash out against me. And sometimes we have developed you know, that kind of conditioning psychologically that we think that every time we fail, somebody's going to lash out against me. I better protect myself. Now listen to this. That wall that you build around your heart to protect you from the feeling of rejection coming from people is the same wall that's keeping you from experiencing the love of God in your life. Are you listening? Many people, I don't feel God loves me. I don't think God loves me. Why? Because people don't love you. Especially people whom you consider to be the ones who should love you. And you feel that God is the same. You see, when you're too self-protective, you cannot receive love, you can also give genuine love. You know why? Because you cannot give something you don't have. In your relationships with people, there will be a lot of insecurity. You'll always be suspicious about what they're thinking about you, how they look at you, or what they're saying about you. And you take offense. And that's why it's so hard to live comfortably with anybody because we're always so concerned about what they think about us. Most of the time, we spend our energies protecting ourselves that there's no more energy left to really love people around us. Do you understand what we're experiencing? See, your identity affects your relationships. It also affects your relationship with God. You begin to think that God is just like your parents, that God is just like people. You know, when you do something wrong, God is going to come down and hit you on the head. That when you do something wrong, God hates you. You believe that God doesn't like you anymore. God has left you. How many, of, how many of you, let's be honest, you'll be surprised if you raise your hands because there's a lot. How many of you, whenever you fall into sin, you feel that God doesn't like you anymore? Come on, let's be honest. Okay, see that? Okay. You know why? Because how we see ourselves, we tend to project on God and other people. We think they think the same. But let me tell you this, the good news. God doesn't think the same like you do about yourself. You understand that? And I'll share you why we experience these kinds of self-condemnations as you take a look at these two great men. Their names are Saul and David. Saul and David 
identity and destiny. That's the title of this message. How many of you know King Saul? Okay. How much do you know about him? He was a king, great. Okay? But at the beginning of his story in 1 Samuel chapter 9, let's take a look at chapter 9. Let's look at verse um, 1 to 5. 1 Samuel 9, verse 1 to 5. And let's take a look at the beginning of the story of Saul. And then I'll show you some more verses. And you tell me, by looking at this, descriptions of Saul, how do you think his father relates to him? Okay? There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish. Say, Kish. Kish. That's the father of Saul. Son of Abiel and son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. So they're coming from the tribe of Benjamin, which is the smallest, uh, the least of all the tribes of Israel, of the 12 tribes. He had a son named Saul. There you are, right? An impressive young man without equal among the Israelites. Okay? Impressive because of his height. The word impressive, by the way, can also be translated handsome. He's handsome, he's tall, and he's uh, most probably dark. <laughs> okay? He's handsome, he's tall. I mean, if you were tall, and listen to this, head taller than any others. I mean, every time he go, comes out of his house, everybody sees him because he always walks taller than, in the, than any person in the crowd. Okay? Tall, wow! And handsome. If you were tall and handsome, how would you feel about yourself? Proud. You feel you have sex appeal, right? I mean, the, the girls are at your mercy. Handsome and tall. Anybody who doesn't like a handsome and tall guy? How many of you like a handsome and tall guy? Okay, great. Now I know. <laughs> He's tall and he's handsome. Okay? But the Bible doesn't mention any other characteristic of Saul except that he's handsome and tall. Period. That's all. And you would think he should be a very proud young man, right? I mean, I'm sure he, you know, he's the crust ng bayan. And I could imagine girls when they say, Oh, I wish you will court me. <laughs> you can imagine girls fighting over him. No, she's mine. No, no, no. She's mine. He's mine. He's mine. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, he would be proud about himself, right? But you know, you'll be surprised. His attitude towards himself is quite the opposite of his physical characteristics. You'll see in a little while. Let's go on the story. Okay? Now, the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. Okay? And Kish said to his son, Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. Why is this? Is it the soul is the one who looks for the donkeys? Probably he is the firstborn. The one responsible over the whole household second to the father. Okay? If he's the firstborn, listen to this. This is very important. And you're the son of a, very, a man of reputation. Go back to verse 1. Look at the uh, reputation of Kish, Kish the father. A man of standing. Did you hear that? Kish, the father of Saul, was a man of reputation in all of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a highly respected man. Okay? And you know, when your daddy is a very highly respected man, you better be better faithful not to do anything that's going to embarrass him before the people. Right? Right? And when you're a father who has a reputation to protect, how are you going to deal with your children, especially when they make a mess? Hmm? Not how you deal with children when they're embarrassing you and you have a reputation, you know. And you know. <coughs> how would you tend to deal with your children? You will repress them. You will lash at them. I have a reputation. Okay? Well, you begin to see in a little while what's going on. Okay, so let's go on. And so he tells okay, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go look for the donkeys. 
You know, if there's one thing that's hard to look for, it's like sheep, you know, sheep are hard to look for when they're lost. Because they're either eaten already by another animal <laughs> or so hard to find them, okay? And especially the donkey, because the donkey is a very stubborn animal. Even if you find them, you're not sure it's going to go with you back home. Okay? He was looking for donkeys, so he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area of around Cilicia, but they did not find them. Now, the later on, the story will say it, it took three days for them to look for the donkeys before Saul finally decided we'd better get home. Okay? Let's take a look there. What happens? Verse 5. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. What kind of father did he have? A father who worries over his adult son. What kind of father worries about his adult son? I mean, he, he's, he might be worrying, now my son is lost. <laughs> the donkeys are lost. My son is looking for them. Now I think my son is lost. Three days. He's not come back. Right? Now what kind of father will worry about an adult son who's taller than anybody? Anybody can see him. Was he raped by a girl somewhere? <laughs> it's too handsome. They're all worried. He said, my father will stop. Will start worrying about us. In the original language, start worrying about me. And later on, Samuel the prophet will confirm that. Okay? In 1 Samuel chapter uh, 10, okay, verse 2, this is what Samuel the prophet will say to Saul later on. When you leave me today, you will meet two men near Rachel's tomb at Zelsa on the border of Benjamin. There you are. They will say to you, the donkeys you set out to look have been found, and now your father has stopped thinking about them, is worried about you. He is asking, what shall I do about my son? This is now the fourth day, okay, that he was away from his house. And the father is saying, what will I do with my son? What kind of father will say those words with an adult young man who's taller than anyone in his, in, you know, in his tribe, and who's supposed to be responsible, right? But he says, what? I'm worried about my son. Ano na naman yung ginawa niya? What, he did, what has he done now? Is he lost? Has he done something wrong? Has he, you know, maybe did something else? I mean, he's always worrying about his son. What does that show? He doesn't trust his son. And many young people today are complaining, Dad, Mom, why can't you trust me? Right? Can't trust his son. Maybe Saul, when he was a young boy, was a very mischievous young boy. Maybe he committed a lot of mistakes, and because of that, his father cannot trust him, right? But he's already adult right now. Do you know what age he was when he became king? It was during this time, he was 30 years old. Now, what kind of father will worry about a 30-year-old young man, amen? And so you ask the question, why is it that the father cannot trust his son? What is the father concerned about most of the time? Protecting his reputation. That's why his eye is always on his son. Don't you do anything. Eh? Oh, embarrassing. What can I do about my son? Now he, I think he's lost. What will the people say? Are you hearing this? Let me tell you, young people. Sometimes our parents don't trust us because we've earned it. We've earned the mistrust. True or false? Because we make promises and we break them. We say, Dad, Mom, okay, I'll come home at 10 and you come home at 1 a.m. Your parents tell you to do something and then you forget about it. And every time it, reminds, it tells you to do something, you always forget about it. You say, yes, Lord, yes, Dad, I'll do my chores and you forget it for one week. Because you're always on the computer. Right? So don't blame your parents when they don't trust you, especially when you know you earned it. You earned the mistrust. Okay? But of course, you want your parents to give you another chance, right? Right? Because you're not perfect, right? 
But what if your parents really stop trusting you until you're 30 years old? I mean, he's, he's a, a, a full-grown man, taller than any other, but his father cannot trust him. Okay? And so how would you feel as a son? Now, when the father cannot trust his son until he's 30, now there's something wrong with the father now, right? Right? But you have to admit that in your younger years, sometimes you earn the mistrust. So instead of defending yourself, apologize and say, Dad, I'm sorry, I take responsibility. Give me another chance to prove you I can change. Okay? And be sure you care that out because that's part of your training as a, as a, as a child and a daughter. But 30 years of age and the father still doesn't trust him, there's something wrong with the father now. Okay? Now let's take a look else. What else reveals to us about how Saul look at himself? You know, when he, you know, after he was looking for those donkeys, listen to this. He cannot find it. The servant said, let's go to this village. I know there's a prophet here. And maybe we can ask him and tell us where the donkeys are. Wow, the servant is the resourceful guy. He knows his way around the place. There's a prophet here. His name is Samuel. And we can ask him and tell us where the donkeys are. So you, you, you can find the donkeys and get home. And then Saul says, well, what shall we give him? Because you just don't go to a prophet without something to give. Well, they look at the bag, all the food is gone. Three days. Okay, they finish all the food in the sack. And so Saul, now we have a problem. If you want to seek help from the prophet, you've got to give him something. You know, why doesn't Saul reach out to his pocket and take out some money? He's the son of Kish. A man of reputation. He must have lots of money, right? You must be shocked. He doesn't have a penny. His servant has money. And the servant said, ah, I've got a quarter of a shekel here, and maybe we can give this to him. You know, the servant has money, the son doesn't have any money. What's going on? So we're supposed to get no money. Huh? From his daddy, right? But his daddy cannot give him any money. But the servant has money. <laughs> a quarter of a shekel in the Old Testament times is equivalent in the time of Christ to one day's wage. One day's salary. So maybe the servant got his salary yesterday for one day and saved it up. And now he's the one who has the money. Why doesn't Saul have any money? Papa doesn't trust his son. He doesn't know where he's going to use that money. He's 30 years old. Are you beginning to wonder? Are you wondering about Saul? Or are you wondering about the father now? <laughs> At the age of 30, he cannot trust it with money. My, my, it's very interesting, right? And not only that, Later on, when Saul Samuel said that God has chosen you to be king, or to be prince over his people, and Saul, you know, reacted and he said in chapter 9, verse 21, can you look at that? Look at the reaction of Saul. 1 Samuel 9, 21. He said, Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel, and is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? I'm like, come on, Prophet Samuel, please don't joke around. <laughs> Why are you saying this? How can that be? I come from this. I know from our ancestor, you know, Jacob, that the king will come to the tribe of Judah. I'm Benjamite. The smallest. And I come from the smallest clan in Benjamin. Why do you say these things to me? Siguro kinakabahan na si Saul ang sinabi ni Samuel, God has chosen you, you know. Who am I? Who am I? I'm too small. Here's a guy who's so tall but looks at himself as very small. Who made him feel small? 
the father made him feel so small when he was so tall. Are you listening? Okay? And listen to this. When he, when the day came for him to be anointed as king over Israel before the people, Samuel the prophet gathered all the tribes of Israel and there he said, we will now anoint your first king. Okay? And we find that in chapter 10. And here we find when Saul was about to be made king, the people were waiting for him. The problem is he was absent. He could not be found. So Samuel began to ask the Lord, where is Saul? Well, take a look at verse 22 of chapter 10. Where is Saul? Why isn't, why isn't he here? And in verse 27, this is what the Lord says. Where was Saul? How can a man so tall successfully hide among baggages? How can a man that tall successfully hide among baggages? Can you imagine him, his position? He was definitely prostrate on the ground. <laughs> I don't remember the big guy, big gesture, all, you know, kumpul, kumpul like this. He was hiding among the baggages, and when, when the Lord said, yes, he has hid himself among the baggages, verse 23, they ran out and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Not only tallest in Benjamin, but tallest in all Israel. And yet he looked at himself as so small, he could not even face the crowd. He could not even face the people. The idea of all the people looking at him just scared him like a small boy and he hid among packages. You know? You know, how do you feel when you first stand here in the pulpit? You feel like... And every eye was on you. You know, you want to hide. That's exactly how he felt. I mean, the eyes of all Israel was going to look on him. He knew about it, just cannot stand that. He, he, he looked down on himself so much that he feels, I'm not worthy. So they had to be pulled out. He had to be pulled out and brought before the people finally. Are you listening? Why did Saul look on himself that way? What kind of identity did he have? Very low view of himself. And definitely the father contributed to that, right? Very few fathers will make their children believe, I believe in you. And I know you can be a great person one day. May I ask you this day, who of you here nakatanggap ka sa father mo na ganito mga salita? Anak, I'm proud of you. I believe in you. And I know you can be great one day. Sino sa inyo nakatanggap ng ganyang salita sa tatay nyo? Tinyo pa yung mga kamay. Ayan, okay. Praise God. Anong epekto sa inyo? What was the effect on you when your dad said that to you? How did you feel? You felt? You felt, wow, right? <laughs> your father is giving you a sense of identity. And the one of the most important roles of fathers in the Bible is to give their children a sense of identity. That's why in the Old Testament, most of the time, it is the father who gives the name to the child. The first identity given to you is your name. And in ancient Israel, fathers bless their children every week. You find all over the Old Testament when David, after dancing with joy, came home to bless his family. That is part of their practice. The fathers, the, the Jewish people, because they have received blessing from their father Abraham, 
know that they must transmit the blessing of their father Abraham by blessing their children so that the blessing of Abraham will pass through them to their children through the declaration of blessing. Are you listening to this? And because they want their children to inherit the blessings of Abraham, they must declare that blessing as regularly as possible on their children so that they will receive that blessing and God will bring to pass his promise to their father Abraham and bless the son and fulfill the promise to their children. Are you listening? That's why fathers are given by God the authority to bless their children. And every time you bless your children, heaven hears that. And heaven will fulfill every word you say in your mouth. My, my children are here, Faye, Shiriel, here, Genesis, Joshua is not here. But I pronounce blessings on my, my family, my children. I give them specific blessings. And you know, they can testify to you. Every word I say always comes to pass. Even the most impossible. Because that is my God-given authority. I must give my children a sense of identity. And that I must give them a sense of destiny. That's my job as a father. Most children today grow up in homes, their identities are cursed by their parents. Because of wrong ways that we have learned from our parents, and this cursing culture has been handed down from generation to generation. And every time we say, I will never be like my parents. I will never do to my children what my parents do to me. Every parent who made that vow end up doing it anyway. And even doing worse than their parents did. You know why? Because of the bitterness inside of us against our parents who dishonored us by their words and how they treated us, we carry that bitterness because we lack that bitterness in a vow that we made. I will never be like my parents. When you said that, you made a vow, you cause the memory of what they've done to you to remain in your heart because the vow lacks that memory in your soul. And that's why that memory of how your parents treated you will unconsciously affect your reactions and your relationships with your children and cause you to unconsciously repeat the mistakes of your parents because the memory of what they need has been locked in your soul because of a vow you made. Are you listening to that? I always do that in our parenting seminars. Ever I say, well, if you made a vow, you'll never be like your parents. A lot of hands will go up. Then I will ask him a second question. I want you to be brutally honest with me. I will say to them, who of you who made that vow get surprised because now you realize you're doing exactly what your parents did to you, to your children. And some of you are doing worse. Can you see those hands? You'll be surprised. Every parenting seminar, almost the same hands will go up and they will look around with shock in their face. And they will look at me and look, you know, their eyes tell you, they're asking the big question, why? If you find yourself doing to your children what your parents did to you, that vow you made is keeping that memory inside your soul and is now conditioning your behavior or reactions towards your children. You understand this? And the only way you can remove that from your soul is to release that vow, renounce it because it was made in bitterness. You lack sin in your heart because bitterness is sin. It gives the devil a hold in your life. Ephesians 4, 26 says, Do not be angry. Do not let the sun go down when you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. When you allow that anger to stay long in your heart, and when you make a vow, you lock that anger in your soul for a long, long time, and you give the devil a foothold in your life, and he will use that foothold to bring you down in your family. Are you listening? If you want to be delivered from that, you must renounce that vow. You don't have anything to prove. And forgive your parents so that you don't have to be oh so self-protective forgive your parents and then just make a choice to love your children not because you're trying to prove something to your parents who maybe already are dead and gone but you want just want to love them as God loves them you understand this you know I'm sharing this I know God is speaking to you. I don't know what kind of parents you had. But if your parents did not give you a whole sense of identity, I want you to know almost everybody in Filipino culture experienced the same thing. You're not alone. 
but you need to know who you are. And David will show us the path. You know, King David was also described like Saul as handsome. There are two handsome men. First Samuel 16, 18. When King Saul was looking for someone who will help him because he was being oppressed by a demon of depression, he was saying that his, his, his official said, Oh, King, why don't we look for a, 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 a man skilled you know, in instruments so he can sing and make music so that when the spirit comes to you, you know, the, hopefully the music will get him out of you when you get depressed. And so one of the servants of Saul said, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the harp. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man, handsome, and the Lord is with him. Are you listening? He's handsome, but he's not tall. He's short. Handsome, but short. You know why? Because in 1 Samuel 16, the same chapter, God commanded uh, Samuel to go to the house of Jesse because he said the next king in Israel, because he already rejected Saul, the next king of Israel will be anointed among his sons. And so Jesse, Jesse welcomed Samuel into his home and Samuel said, present to me all your sons because the Lord has sent me here to anoint the next king of Israel. And so, well, Jesse presented all his seven sons minus one. The youngest was not added to the line. There was, the first was Eliab, Abinadab, Shama, the less are not named, okay? And then only seven of them were brought. And when Samuel looked at them, Eliab, the, the tallest, wow, tall like Saul. <laughs> you know, I just discovered that Samuel has a weakness for tall guys. <laughs> he must be the one. He's tall like Saul. And the Lord spoke to him, I have rejected him. Man doesn't look at the heart. A man that looks only at the external appearance, but God looks at the heart, and I have rejected him. And then comes Abinadab, tall, not that one. Shama, somewhat tall, not that one. And then all the seven pass by, and nobody, nobody qualified because the Lord did not tell him to anoint any one of those seven. And so Samuel was asking, Jesse, are you hiding a son? I'm sure I came to the right address. No? <laughs> the Lord told me clearly, I will anoint the next king among your sons. And you, you said you presented me all your sons. Are you hiding a son? Do you, don't you have yet another son? Ah, yes, yes, yes uh, the youngest. But, but he's taking care of the sheep, you know. In ancient Israel, the lowest kind of job you can get is to take care of sheep. That's a despised profession. When you're a shepherd, people look down on you. In Israel, are you listening to this? Okay? And so he was the shepherd boy, and listen to this. He was not as tall as the seven brothers because he was short. And so someone said, call him. We will not sit down until he comes. Nako, propeta nagsabi noon. Jesse, come on, get, get, get David, get David. And when David entered the door, the Lord said, He is the one. Anoint him. And he anointed him before the brothers. Hallelujah. This is the one that will be king over my people, Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, what is it that made God choose David? Because he's handsome? Because he's a skilled musician with a harp? And he had small harps, not big ones, okay? And because he was a man, eloquent, great in speech? How do you know that David is so eloquent with words? Read the book of Psalms. Have you read the book of Psalms? David wrote almost all of that. He's a man of great words, very eloquent young man, skilled musician, handsome, and a brave warrior. Wow. Sounds like the opposite of Saul. You know what happened to Saul? In 1 Samuel 13, he had his first mandate before God to deliver Israel from the Philistines. At that time, when he was called by God, the Philistines were the number one enemies of Israel. 
And so the Philistines started to gather around, and Samuel said to him, you wait for me. I will offer the sacrifice before you start the battle. And so Saul waited. And while he was waiting, the Philistine army were amassing around them on the mountain. Wow, tens of thousands of Philistines. And then some of his soldiers were beginning to hide in the caves. He was losing soldiers. And he said, Samuel is late. And he got scared. He got scared. And instead of waiting for Samuel, he offered the sacrifice so they can start the battle. That was forbidden for him to do that. Only the prophet can offer sacrifices, not the man of blood like him. And so when Samuel came, what have you done? I was afraid because of the people were scattering. Oh. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, the Lord has taken the kingdom away from you and is giving you to one of your neighbors. But yet he had another chance. Chapter 15. God told Samuel, tell Saul, destroy all the Amalekites in the land because I made a vow to Joshua that because of what he did in that first blood against the Amalekites, that I will blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. That's a promise I gave to Joshua. Because after the Exodus, the first people to fight against Israel were the Amalekites. And God made a vow, I will destroy Amalek. He said, now tell Saul to fulfill the promise, destroy all the Amalekites in the land, leave no one alive, even the sheep, the animals, all, all the animals be put to the sword. And you know what Saul did, right? Right? So he fought, he won the battle against the Amalekites. And now Samuel came to the battlefield after the victory. And when he comes to the battlefields, Saul was not there. Opposite na ngayon. In chapter 13, it was Saul who was waiting and Samuel who was late. This time, it's Samuel who's waiting and Saul is late. And then he asked, where's Saul? Oh, he, he went up to Mount Carmel to build a monument for himself. What? What? He's building a monument for himself? Yes, sir. And so finally when Saul came, he said, Oh, Samuel, I have obeyed everything that the Lord has commanded. And then Samuel said, mm -hmm. Then what is this bleating of rams that I hear? Ah, yeah, oh, we, we, we saved the best of the herds of the Amalekites to give them as an offering to God. Liar. Later on, he will confess. Because I had to give in to the people. They wanted the booty as the reward. And so I gave them the animals. What a liar said. For God is for the soldiers. Saul became what? A people pleaser. Because he has no sense of identity in himself. He had to keep pleasing people so he will give them a sense of identity. You know why? Because he grew up with a father who never gave him a sense of identity. He was only a son living in the shadow of his father. He had no identity in himself. That's why he grew up longing for his own identity. And because he had no sense of identity, he began to get it from people. And in order for people to give him that sense of that, he had to keep pleasing them and giving them. That's why he had to disobey God in order to please the people. Are you listening here? That's why Samuel said to him in chapter 15, were you not small in your own eyes when I first talked to you? You were small in your own eyes. Why have you disobeyed God? Don't you know that obedience is better than sacrifice? Are you hearing what's happened to Saul? Because of his lack of identity, he could never obey God completely because he always had to please people. How many of you are tired of trying to please people? Right? It's so hard. And how can you obey God when you want to please people? Your barcada. You understand that your friends. But David was opposite. You know about David? He was also despised. He was despised by his own father. 
Later on in chapter 6, 17, we'll discover even Eliab, his brothers, despised him. When his father told him, go to the battlefield and see how your brothers are. Because it was the time he heard that Goliath was challenging the Israelites and nobody would dare face Goliath. And so well, when David came into the battlefield, this Eliab said, what are you doing here? Mm, you came here just to watch the battle and see our embarrassment? How conceited of you. <laughs> Very just met. How conceited of you. And what did you do to those few sheep you left in the wilderness? You're so responsible. You, you, you know, there's a few sheep left. What judgment? That's not true. David defended those sheep with his own life. That's why he said to Saul, you know, when a bear or a lion will come against the sheep, I take the bear, the lion by the hair and kill it. He was a faithful shepherd of his brother. He, you're, not, you're irresponsible. You're conceited. You just came here to embarrass us. You know, you're good for nothing. None of you have heard words like that. That even your most sincere motives interpreted as bad. And you're being accused of something that's not true. You all experience that, right? No? David had that. And later, you know, when he prayed, came to Saul, he said, let me kill this giant. And so look at him from head to toe. My boy, you're just a boy. This man is a professional killer. How can you fight him? I mean, he despised David. Shepherd na, maliit pa, mukhang bata pa. Para may gatas pa sa bibig. And you know what David said? Hear me, O king. Whenever a sheep, whenever a lion or a bear comes against my sheep, I take him by the hair and kill him. As the Lord has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear, so the Lord will deliver me from this Philistine. Let me kill him. Impress, wow. Sige, sige. Give him my armor, the best armor. And so they put the armor of Saul. He disappeared in the armor. <laughs> Saul was Saul. Remember, Saul was tall. And you put an armor on a small guy, he definitely would disappear inside the armor. <laughs> he said, I cannot go in this. I'm not used to this. You're going to face a professional killer with no armor of defense. No, I come to him in the name of the Lord my God, the God of Israel. And he came before Goliath. And Goliath, just like Saul, the brothers of, of David and his father, when Goliath saw David, he said, he despised him and cursed him with his gods. What are you, boy? You're coming to me with sticks and stones. Am I a dog? <laughs> and he cursed him by his gods. My goodness. You know, despised by his father, despised, cursed by his brothers, despised by his soul, now cursed by Goliath. Who will be next? Don't worry, there's another one. Michal, his wife, will later on despise him also. Pero did this cursing of people affect Saul's, David's identity? I'm going to ask you why. Why is it that Saul, whose identity was damaged as a young man because of his overprotective father? And here's David, cursed by many, but loved by the people. How could he have risen up with still a strong sense of identity? Let me show you how he said, and, and this will finally reveal to you the true character of David. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, take a look at his words when he came before Goliath. And this will reveal to you the true, that how David sees himself. Okay? So take a look now at uh, chapter 16, uh, 17. Let's start reading from verse 43. Uh, verse 42. Verse 42. It's 1 Samuel 16, uh, 17, verse 42. Are you here? This is Goliath. Goliath looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you, can, can you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You're nothing. Okay? 
And David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh El Shaddai, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and all the world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands wow hallelujah hallelujah he had a strong sense of what identity he knew who he was and where he stood unlike Saul every time Goliath will throw a challenge Saul and his generals will run into the tent with their you know with their tails down at the back. Not at all a brave warrior. But what made David a brave warrior? What made him stand? Even though everybody cursed him, he was not affected. How could he stand with such a strong sense of faith and identity? That he said, Ikaw, sinasabi mo ako ang pagkain. Ikaw ang pagkain. Ibibigay ka sa akin ng aking Diyos. At puputulin ko ulo mo. At yung buong army ng Philistine, papakainin namin sa mga ibon. Tanda ka na ba? <laughs> Grabe. Where did he get that strong sense of identity? Take a look at one of his Psalms in Psalm 63. When he wrote this, it was at his lowest point of his life because although he was already anointed king of Israel, Saul will not give the throne to him. And King Saul haunted, haunted him like an animal to kill him. And he was at this time hiding among the caves of the wilderness of, Ju of, Ju of Ju Judea, trying to avoid confrontation with King Saul's army. He was hiding in the caves. And in that wilderness, there was no water. They're running out of water in their, in their water skins. And they were, David was so thirsty. But deeper than the physical thirst that David felt was his thirst for God. You know why? Because he missed the sanctuary in Jerusalem. He missed the sanctuary where he would worship God. He missed his times of worship before God with his harp. Because all throughout his childhood until he became king, David was a worshiper. And because he spent time seeing God, and knowing that God loved him, he found his true identity in God's love for him. That he recognized that he had a father who is greater than his earthly father. And that this father gave him the highest sense of identity because he knew he was a son in the sight of that father. And look at his words in this psalm. Psalm 63, verse 1 up to verse 6. David says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Next. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Lord, I miss you. Here am I, hounded by King Saul. My life is threatened. I can be killed anytime. But you know, he's not even thinking about himself. He's longing for God. God, I miss you. I beheld you before in the sun. I've seen your power and your glory. And here am I in this bare wilderness with a few band of soldiers to protect me. Where are you? I long for you. And next verse. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Where did David find his identity? In God's love for him. Father, you have given me more worth than any human being can give me. I've been despised by my family, despised by everybody. But you're the only one who believes in me. And I thank you for your love for me. Next verse. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. His life was threatened. He can be killed anytime. He's running short of supplies and resources. They can die of thirst in the wilderness. And yet, he was only thinking of one thing. Lord, my soul will be satisfied in your presence. In your presence as with the richest of foods. Lord, With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Where is the longing of the heart? 
when you're in trouble? Whom do you think of when you're in trouble? Tatay ko po, nanay ko po, right? But King David had only one father to turn to, and it was God Almighty. And in that father, he found all the love that he needed. That's why to be in your presence is everything to me. I want you to know this. And I know God is speaking to you right now. However your parents treated you, I want you to know that your Father in heaven doesn't treat you the same. Your parents may have cursed you. Your parents may have looked down on you. My parents may have said, wala kang kwentang anak. Wala kang pupuntahan. Sira ulo ka. Wala kang halaga. And maybe you felt that way. But I want you to know, your heavenly Father doesn't see you that way. And only the Father's love can heal that damaged identity. Can we all bow down our heads in prayer? Whatever dishonor, whatever curse you have experienced in the past from anyone in your life, your parents, your relatives, I want you to make a decision today. If you want to experience the love of your Father in heaven, He wants you to forgive them for what they have done to you. And recognize that they, that's all that they knew. However they treated you, that was all that they knew. And for them, that was the best that they can do for you. Even if you feel, even their best was not good enough. They're not perfect parents, nobody is. Neither will you be a perfect parent yourself. I want you to come to God today. And remember that God, your Father in heaven, looks down on you right now with all the love a father can give you. A love that protects, a love that forgives, a love that overlooks offenses, a love that will be faithful to you even when you're not faithful to him, a love that will carry you even if you feel you have failed God. He will never leave you. He will never look down on you. He will never despise you. The fact is, He honored you by giving the life of His Son Jesus for you. Just to save you from your sins. There is no greater honor a person can give to another than to lay down his life for that person. And I want you to know that God gave the life of His Son, Jesus, for you. Just for you to be restored back to Him. So that He can make you whole again. He wants to impart to you an identity that no one on earth can ever give you. And that is the identity of being His son and His daughter. The son and daughter of God Almighty. And according to God's word, he has blessed you with everything that belongs to Jesus, His Son. And if you open your heart to God and release forgiveness to those people who have abused you, who have bring damage to your life, brought damage to your life, He will be the one to take their place and bring healing to your wounds. Can you make that choice today? Lord, I forgive in obedience to your command by choice. I forgive my parents and everyone who have made me hate myself, made me look down on myself. And Lord, I recognize that I am responsible today for how I look at myself. And Lord, if I have reacted against them in rebellion, bitterness, I take responsibility for my wrong choices and I ask your forgiveness. 
Lord, please come and heal my wounded life and forgive me for all my sins. For I recognize as people have done wrong against me, I also did wrong to people. And I take responsibility for those wrong reactions. Because I know you hold me responsible for every choice I make. And I ask you to forgive me. And Lord, would you remove all the walls I built in my heart all these years? And Lord, I open my heart to you to receive your love for me as my true Father. And I thank you, Lord, that as your word says, you believe in me enough to see me worth dying for on the cross. Lord, you gave me back my identity and you took away my shame because of my sins. And Lord, you suffered my punishment on my behalf so that you can take all my shame away so I can be reconciled with your Father forever because of what you have done. Father, I receive you as my Father and Lord Jesus as my Savior this day. And Father, help me to walk in the light of your love each day. Every day in your word, you affirm me and let me know that you will never abandon me nor fail me. That your love for me is here to stay and nothing that I ever do can take away your love for me. You love me enough that while I was yet a sinner, you gave Jesus for me. All you want is for me to be back in your arms. And today, Father, I run to you. I run to you, Father, as I know you are running to me right now. And I want your embrace. I receive your love today, Father. And I receive your healing in my life. And thank you, Father, that you will never reject me. For your forgiveness will always be there for my sins. And your love will be my strength and the joy of my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.